Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Positive Psychology Hour, a partnership and collaboration that we have with the Whole Being Institute. My name is Caroline Colis, and I'm the Senior Director of Health and Wellness at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Today, we're going to be discussing Help Your Mental Health, an interview with Barbara Fredrickson. What have we learned about navigating COVID-19 in a psychologically healthy way? Today, join Megan McDonough as she interviews Barbara Fredrickson, a leading scholar in the field of positive psychology and the originator of the broaden and build theory of positive emotions. In this session, we'll explore what the latest research says about the pandemic's impact and how we can buffer, bolster, and build, BBB, our mental health as we prepare to come out of this pandemic. Barbara Fredrickson has been advancing the science of positive emotions for more than 30 years. She is currently Ken Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We've got a couple of folks from North Carolina on the call today, where she holds appointments in psychology and business and directs the PEP Lab. She has authored 100 plus peer reviewed articles and book chapters and her books Positivity and Love 2.0 have been translated into more than 20 languages. And Megan McDonough is the um, founder and uh, CEO of the Whole Being Institute. Barbara, one of the reasons I was so excited about starting this positive psychology series with Megan was that you know, during 9-11, we learned so much about resilience. And then once again, last year, New York was the epicenter of the COVID crisis. And I thought, my gosh, I just wanted our community, which had never been online before, to benefit from the experience of what we had learned back then. And to come out of this a year later, I didn't know what we would be, what it would be like, but to come out of this with resilience. And Megan was generous enough to join with me and uh, partner with me in this. And you also were able to come on to the show as well. So I welcome both of you to the call. I'm looking forward to this interview and I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It's good to be here again. It's a pleasure to be here again, my friend. Boy, we're marking a year of complete weirdness. And even though we have a year of weirdness, we will start with a habit that we have cultivated in our time together, which is the centering, right? We start any time with the centering. So um, I invite you to put your stuff away. If you can't hear me, I don't know. I have a big voice. I know some people are having a hard time hearing. Hopefully you can hear okay. Um, use this time as a pause point. So put your stuff away, close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so. If not, just take a soft gaze. Take a deep breath in. And a big exhale. And with that exhale of breath, allow whatever came before this moment to just dissolve. If it doesn't dissolve of its own, just lovingly place it to the side. You can come back to it later. Another deep breath in. Big exhale. And with that exhale, just noticing what's true for you in this moment. So bringing your attention all the way down to your toes. Noticing your feet and your shins, your knees, your thighs. The whole length of the spine right up to the crown of the head. Notice if you can drop the weight off of your shoulders so that there's more room between the shoulders and the ears. Being aware of the sleeves of both arms and feeling the sleeves of your arms with your own attention right down into each finger. Noticing the face, any expressions that may be there 
and then scanning the body and seeing what emotions are present now. What is some felt sense of sensations in the physical body? How are you? Another deep breath in. Big exhale. And with that last exhale, just noticing what you're looking forward to in this next hour. What are you hoping for, looking for, connecting with? Deep breath in. And on this last exhale, opening your eyes, taking a moment and just scrolling through our lovely Zoom family and see if you can't make eye contact with as many folks, new folks and folks that maybe you see week after week. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. I didn't think it would take me so long to scroll through. There are a lot of you here. <laughs> I'm glad you're all here. Ah, thanks, I needed that. I always appreciate our centering. Barbara, great to be here with you today. So I want to start my friend thinking back in time to these last 12 months when we got together. You know, it's funny when I think about the last 12 months, I didn't even know Caroline. I'd never met her. In fact, her and I have never met in person. Phoebe, of course, I've worked with. And during this time, I noticed that when we get together and I look at her through these Zoom calls and we sort of connect over this shared experience, that there's a warmth that arises. There's a a sense of connection with her. And even today, my friend, as I think about being with you again, and I think back to our filming in North Carolina and the dinner that we shared and the times that we, and even being here now, it brings a sense of um, happiness, of, uh, of connecting with you. I guess I would call that love, if that, and I guess since you wrote the book on love, it's not too sappy to use that word love in terms of how I feel about this team, about you, about the people that are connected in this community. And in fact, I get many emails from this community saying to me, thank you so much for these calls, you know, every, every week because it connects me with other people. Is this what you call positivity resonance? You know, I, I think it is. And I've, I've um, come to see in this past year that it is much more possible over mediated means than I suspected. Um, maybe because we so desperately need more of it in our lives that um, uh, connecting through something like Zoom or we didn't even know the word Zoom a year ago, <laughs> Skype or other things, but connecting through video chat, FaceTime used to be a very clear second to face to face but if we take out face to face in the broader community this we invest more in how we connect online and i think that when people have that greater investment bring more of themselves their kind of authentic felt experience their positive emotions to this context yeah that can be positivity resonance which i describe as the most elemental unit of love. There are lots of things we call love, bonds, long lasting things, you know, unconditional positive regard for the whole world. At the heart of it, I think, are these moments of positive connection where we collaborate and co-experience positive emotions. Those positive emotions that we feel together, just even for a moment, are really vital nourishment for health and well-being and community health, not just individual health. 
And that's really fascinating when we think about community health. And before I go down that path of community health, uh, health, I just want to ask all of you guys if you've noticed and felt that positivity resonance and you've done breakout groups, we've talked to folks, if you yourself have been felt connected, not to a thing that you're learning, but people that you're in community with. Um, if anyone has anything to say about that, that chat into um, the chat box would be great. Love to hear from you. So when we talk about positivity resonance and we talk about this connection between people and we think, oh, this benefits me, there's a component of it that not only um, creates a we, but even a, societally, a societal public health, which is shocking to me because I never, I never thought about it in that context before. So what have you, what, you know, share with us a little bit more about what is the relationship between this positivity resonance in public health. Yeah, when I first um, began empirical work on this idea of positivity resonance, these positive moments of connection, I focused on the mental health benefits to the individual and the health benefits to the individual, which are plentiful and, and present. And then um, in 2019, even before the pandemic, I started thinking about how do these moments contribute to community health up at that broader level. And especially inspired by all the, you know, the kind of tearing at the social fabric that we've all experienced over the last few years in terms of polarization and, and um, lack of uh, in-person connection, kind of substituting a lot of words flying around in social media for social connection. And um, so I began a program of work on how positivity resonance contributes to virtue development um, mm -hmm. uh, and in particular pro people's pro-social tendencies and um, focused on a, a set of virtues or pro-social tendencies that bear a, a close connection to the experience of positivity resonance because when people are connecting and co-experiencing positive emotions, part of the phenomenology, part of how it feels is that there's a felt unity between, you feel at one with the other, you feel um, uh, connected and of a piece. So that's a self-transcendent experience, right? Mm -hmm. You feel you feel the bigger than yourself. You, yourself is part out here in the we, <laughs> as well as in, in here. So that expanded sense of self, I think, is a building block for a broader spiritual awareness of the unity uh, across all of humanity. So recognize when you recognize there's a hu universal human um, condition or universal human connection or feel a sense of caring for, for humanity, um, that is, um, a way of looking at the world spiritually um, that I think grows out of having felt these moments of oneness with individual people or in smaller groups, because none of us have experience with all of humanity. <laughs> so we have stand-ins for all of humanity. And in particular, our interactions with strangers and acquaintances end up being our proximal first person experiences of connecting with humanity. So I think the emotional quality of those connections can be a source of building the sense of oneness or uh, uh, that is a key feature of spirituality, of many people's spirituality. And as researchers study what spirituality is, there's a facet of it that is this, um, uh, human oneness or unity across all people. Um, so that I think comes just out of the very nature of positivity resonance being self-transcendent and creating a perception of oneness. And that oneness has kind of a, a it changes the way we view other people and changes the way we view ourselves because that oneness, you're, com you're coming together with others on an equal plane. It's, there's not a power 
dynamic or a hierarchy and positivity resonance. There may be different roles that might be parent and child or whatever, but when you collaborate and experience positive emotions together, th those kind of roles kind of slip out of you and you become a little more connected human to human. And so I think offshoots of that um, spiritual sense of oneness is a caring and concern for the other. And also a sense that the other person is just as important as you are, <laughs> you know? So that's uh, where, why I think humility would grow also from experiences of positivity resonance that we, we should um, kind of set aside our self aggrandizement and let other people, you know, enjoy the spotlight. And that those kind of actions are, are, are ones that are other focused and self-transcendent and um, uh, count as a pro-social tendency to let other, let other people be great too, not just ourselves. <laughs> mm. So, um, so those are the three um, uh, pro-social tendencies that I first started to look at spirituality, altruism, giving and caring and being compassionate and uh, humility which comes in many forms, including intellectual humility, being open to understanding other people's perspectives. Um, in addition, in some other studies we measured uh, directly with an unpublished scale that's been floating around the scientific literature, love of humanity, you know, the, the degree to which people will endorse, they, you know, they feel a strong connection of love to strangers um, anywhere and not just their inner circle. So, um, what we learned is that people's day-to-day -day experiences of positive connection, positivity resonance, um, go hand in hand with these pro-social tendencies. So there's, um, there's a correlation between individuals, but also within individuals across days. So days that you, um, Megan, feel more positivity resonance with others will be days that you will also endorse being kinder more humble and feeling more of a connection to all of humanity. So it varies both between us and within us over time. And um, we also did a study before uh, the current pandemic times back in 2019, which feels like a decade ago. <laughs> it really <laughs> where, does. Yeah. We, um, we did this micro intervention where, where um, I probably spoke about this before, where we just do a little bit of psychoeducation about this idea of positivity resonance, and then suggest that this might be important for well being. And, and so maybe we should all do it more, <laughs> connect more, lean into the opportunities to connect more, prioritize it basically. Mm -hmm. And um, we find that when people prioritize positive connections, especially with strangers and acquaintances, making that their goal, that raises people's uh, pro-social tendencies. So it's a way to develop community relevant virtues, not by didactic telling people about virtues and saying, go be good, <laughs> that people become good through having these shared positive experiences. Um, uh, and we can kind of grow our own um, betterment by just prioritizing ways of um, uh, connecting with others, especially strangers and acquaintances, I think, because we tend to really overlook those opportunities, kind of considering them transactional or uh, throw away as we rush off to find those people in our inner circle or figure out our to-do list. And, and um, you know, making it a habit to not look past people, to connect in ever, however small a way is, uh, contributes to the quality of our day-to-day -day lives and also our um, pro-social tendencies. And in, I, as I began to think, you know, so many of our studies in my lab got sidelined with the pandemic. We were about to start another study where we were going to encourage college students to have more face-to-face -face interactions with strangers, which of Oops, course- That's not happening. <laughs> that's not happening. So even, even when research resumed, we couldn't resume that study. Yeah. Hopefully we'll start it next year. Um, 
we got our fingers crossed. We'll we'll see as as more college students become vaccinated, it'll become possible again. Um, but as we were kind of regrouping and figuring out what contribution could we make, you know, during the pandemic, still we began a series of studies that were based on um, completing online surveys. But instead of just doing um, kind of cross-sectional surveys, which have their shortcomings, we decided to um, strengthen the work by looking at things longitudinally and also with this um, really detailed sampling called the day reconstruction method, mm -hmm. where um, it's like doing an archaeological dig into the contents of each person's day. So people think through their their whole day, the whole last 24 hours, and um, describe their day in a series of epi episodes, like being in this webinar or you know having um, coffee with your partner in the morning or whatever, breaking it all down. And in each of those episodes, we give a little survey. And so for all of the episodes that included another person, we asked about perceptions of positivity resonance. And it was through that work and looking at that longitudinally that we found that as we had found before the pandemic, people's day-to-day -day experiences of positivity resonance predict their pro-social tendencies, but those pro-social tendencies in turn predict the effort people put into social distancing, the consistency that they wear face coverings and wash their hands. So those pro-social tendencies are casting forward into behaviors that we know protect public health. So um, the, qual the, the emotional quality of your day-to-day -day connections with others um, is good for you, it's good for your relationship, it's good for public health. Um, and I think we're able to capture that in a pandemic and it's probably um, also possible to um, capture it outside of pandemic in terms of the safety and care with which people drive. You know, are they, are they putting others at risk the way they move through the world? I mean, there's just all kinds of ways that those pro-social tendencies protect the quality of our communities. Mm. So this is, you just, I feel like I have to listen to this last 10 minutes, maybe 50 times. Because <laughs> I, whoa, I was writing notes, I'm taking. So I just want to unpack a kind of basic sentence. It looks like when we are connected with others and with this in this warm way, and it could be micro moments, we're not talking about big, we're just talking about the way in which we show up in this moment in front of another person, right here, right now. Mm -hmm. How we show up, that positivity resonance between us builds virtues in us that help another person and build a stronger community. And thinking about virtues in that way is really a new way of thinking about virtues versus, oh, this is my strength. This is how I can use it here. It's wow, this really benefits the community building. So the, you know, I was reading through your, your article about um, how you are more tend, you more tend to wash your hands because all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, I just connected with someone. Let me, you know, let me connect, let me wash my hands so I'm safer for the person I meet next. Let me wear my mask because I care about this other person. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot going on in chat too. So I just want to um, acknowledge what people are saying here. So let me take a moment. Um, when I initially asked what people were feeling in this community about the positivity resonance, um, love times 10, the power of community. Yes, indeed. Love the Zoom call, be able to thrive because of this connection. Breakouts have definitely helped with the connection. So it's not just a talking head. It's actually you guys connecting, meeting with people all over the world. Uh, the pregame show, even connecting before those of you who show up early and get to see all of our bumps and warts along the way. Uh, one of the surprising gifts of COVID, being able to connect in a very tangible way. Appreciative, with gratitude, compassion, and kindness. So I'm not alone. Just even being able to get together and uh, Mega said this is yoga in a nutshell. Um, so, so much there. Thank you everyone for your, for your, um, points. Something came came up to me actually when you were talking about love of humanity. 
there's a saying in yoga when people would go on yoga retreats and they would cultivate this 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 beautiful love of humanity. I mean, love with humanity. And then when they go home back to their everyday life, they couldn't stand people. So, <laughs> so I, I think what I hear you saying is like the love of humanity is this big theoretical construct. We can't know all of humanity. But I can actually look you in the eye when I'm talking with you. And it's that person to person interaction that when we grow that, it expands to a, a love of humanity that's bigger versus the other way around. Go isolate yourself, get a love of humanity, and then come back and you can't stand people because you're so used to being in your own space. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's not an abstraction. I mean, we, um, you know, the, those sayings about, you know, be the change you want to be in the world is um, really uh, well uh, described here that the experiences that you create, the quality of them is um, uh, just helps to change our orientation towards ourselves and other people in ways that help us to care more, to take action, to safeguard the other, mm -hmm. um, to um, try to get others out of harm's way. You know, I think it's going to be part of the deep care that re both replenishes us and will help us continue on in, um, you know, deal with difficulties and like structural inequities and other things. I saw a question come into the, the direct, as a direct message about how can this um, uh, concept of spirituality not bypass dealing with difficulties and, and um, structural inequities. I think the the breadth of thinking that you get with positive emotions because they open us, allow us to take in more ideas, see the big picture and manipulate the concepts in that big picture better. We're, we're more creative at rethinking how things should be when we're in these positive states and positivity resonance will help us care more about doing that. Um, no, I mean, those are my predictions. We need to study that directly. And well, you did some work on the own race bias, didn't you, with positive emotions and own race bias? Uh, mm -hmm. We found that um, when people were experiencing uh, a mild positive emotions, even individually, just, you know, um, induced in a laboratory setting by watching a short comedy, um, we found that people were better able to recognize individuals across racial lines than they are when they're in a neutral state. Um, that is um, uh, what happens in a neutral state and a negative emotional state is what's described in the literature as um, people have an, uh, a bias towards recognizing people of their own race as individuals. And they tend to mix up people of a different race, not see their individuality. And so positive emotions are, um, have been demonstrated to help people see the individual beyond the skin color, beyond the, um, the form of difference, cultural difference. Mm -hmm. And so that I think is um, especially needed as we try to refashion and reckon um, with um, stuff we should have dealt with decades ago, <laughs> so. And yet it's still here, I know. Um, and Mega had a quick question about uh, if you've done any studies with uh, pro-social tendencies with Zoom, like in this, in this arena, have, has there been any work in that? Yeah, my uh, current doctoral student, Kwa Lewin, is doing some work where he's looking at online groups, um, online uh, support groups, and finds that there are certain features of how people uh, respond to one another, especially the, the speed at which they respond, um, uh, even in messaging back and forth, um, creates that feeling of being in sync, right? So in the ways, the, the standards for being in sync change when you're this in this means versus another. And, but there are still ways to um, convey and, 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 um, kind of approximate that I'm attending to you and I'm um, you know, being really other focused. 
we can't make eye contact no matter how hard I try. I know we can't. I know. I, in fact, I look up to the picture. I look down at you. Yeah. I look up. No, yes, it's, it's not. Impossible. It's just yeah. broken. It's just yeah. broken. Yeah. So we have to do other things. Sometimes we make our gestures bigger or yeah. find other ways to to show attention or just realize that this normal cue is just broken this yeah. way. And, and I so, do find there's something about the environment that you, the context in which you hold, the space that you hold, because I have been invited to speak at certain webinars that will remain unnamed. And the norm is no one's looking at one another. Everyone has their video off. No one's responding. It's sort of like the effort you put in to connect, even in Zoom. So if Meg is doing lecture yoga dance and she's doing movement and everybody else is those of you who have done Let Your Yoga Dance, love my belly, love my butt. Um, if you're all doing that and you're looking and laughing at one another, there's shared laughter, there's shared fun, even across the way. We should talk a little bit about laughter and, and Sarah Aljo's work on shared laughter and how that helps connect us. Any well, comments on that one? Yeah, I, I want to just get back to the issue of having your camera on or not. It, it is a great example about how any social interaction is risky. Yeah. Right? We can always be subject to judgment and um, uh, or being ignored. And so sometimes the way we control that is to pull away and protect ourselves. And sometimes we're just in our 90s and we don't want our camera. Yeah. yeah. I get but, that. We're, <laughs> but we're not, yeah, but we're not, like you said, putting in the effort and taking the risk. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, to get to reap the benefits, we need to take risks. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're not always in the mood to take a risk. Mm -hmm. I have my camera off sometimes, but when I'm in, right. when I'm in charge of the meetings, <laughs> <laughs> the cameras be on, unless someone has, you know, really extreme circumstances, you know, that everybody knows when that is. So, you know, we allow that, but we highly encourage cameras. Oh my God, them. Barbara, I have to tell you this morning at breakfast, my husband said to me, oh, you have a webinar today. <laughs> and I said, yes, of course. I, how did you know that? I didn't think I told you my schedule. He says, well, look at you, did your hair. So <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently yeah. I have been letting my personal grooming get a bit astray during the COVID times so or my husband yeah. can even tell when I have a webinar. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so we put in the time when we can put in the effort. And uh, but we can still that, wear that sweatpants. Way we <laughs> What's that? We can still wear sweatpants. <laughs> I, I have my jeans on. I do have my beach pants on. Yes, I do. Um, so in terms of the, this connection with laughter, uh, with Sarah Aljo's work and social connection, how does that play into positivity resonance and what we're talking about here? Yeah, one of the things that uh, Sarah Aljo and her, her collaborators found that um, we've seen in work that we've done as well is that the, it matters a lot whether you're laughing together mm -hmm. rather than um, uh, one person laugh and then the other person laugh. I mean, you'd think that being in synchrony wasn't that important, but the having the, the moments where um, couples, these were romantic couples, are laughing at the same time contribute to the quality of their connection. The, not their total laughter, just the amount that overlaps. And we find that in um, the studies I did um, with uh, Bob Levinson's team when I was on sabbatical at Berkeley, we dug into this really rich data set of long-term married couples, 150 long-term married couples. They've been married either 15 years or 35 years. And um, the again, they have a conversation, they're talking about a difficult topic, Later, we videotape those. Later, they come back. Um, I say we because I actually was a postdoc in his lab 25 years ago. Oh, wow. Data. Um, so uh, people came back a week later, watched the video of their conversation with their spouse by themselves and used this sort of old school rating dial to indicate how positive or negative they were feeling each second. And then what we did, you know, more recently is look at when do people agree on when it's positive yeah. versus how, how much or how positive do they think it is overall? And the best predictor of the quality of their marriage is the number of seconds that they both say are positive. 
the amount of positivity that you feel that your partner doesn't doesn't say a thing about how wow. satisfied your relationship satisfying your relationship is to you it's only when they're there with you in that second and we also know that in those seconds when people report both feeling positive at the same time their physiology is in sync their nonverbal behaviors are in sync every, every all those things um, co-occur within seconds. So these are really um, capturing the degree of connection that happens between us when we feel good together is far greater than the degree of connection biologically that is present if we feel bad together. Yeah. And, so, and just so we don't become neurotic, it's not like I have to ask my husband every five seconds, are you, are you, you feel positive? I feel positive now. <laughs> They're sort of naturally occurring, correct? When we're, yeah. we don't have to control for it and make it fake. And, you know, it's just what happens when we are, we honestly show up and the other person is there as well. Yes. Yeah, it's so much. Well, it's, I think the only reasonable means to get this is to just realize that we humans know how to connect. We just have to prioritize it and make it an intention. If we try to um, jumpstart the system through a different way, like I'm gonna mimic your face, your gestures <laughs> and your facial expression, that's, it's, it's gonna lead to um, an, an inauthenticity that is immediately picked up by the other person. And it's like, ah, oh, this is bogus. You know, the other person is gonna feel what you feel, which is insincerity. And that mm. doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> so yeah, that, it, you know that, it has that's, to not a, that's not a winner on either side yeah exactly uh, I, I got a few notes coming in uh first of all i'm glad your question was answered monica i get that and there was a question about uh well two things you have mentioned yes these are there is a, a risk in sharing your your video because you're also videotaped and so you have you know do i feel comfortable with this and the amount of vulnerability that you want to feel in connection so thank you for that judith i appreciate that comment and Lisa was asking about laughter yoga, if you've ever done any work or studied that, or um, that's interesting because what they do in laughter yoga, it is rather contrived, but you all agree to be contrived with laughter in a certain way. And then at some point it pops and becomes yeah. uh, real laughter. Mm -hmm. It's hysterical, really, if you've ever done it. Yeah, yeah. I've done it um, uh, a bit. We have a really gifted um, laughter uh, yoga. He calls it laughter meditation. Um, uh, leader it locally and it's it's a lot of fun but I think from scientifically I think those um, contrived ho 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 he 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 kind of things they're a springboard yeah. to share genuine laughter and it's when you spring in <laughs> or dive into that um, genuine shared laughter that's when there starts to be that real benefit um, uh, I've I've in my mind designed all these studies to do with um, <laughs> laughter yoga, but I haven't, I haven't, um, haven't carried them out. It's just we actually did laughter yoga here a couple of times. We have a oh. certificate alumni who is, who is also gifted in that. So we've shared that, but it does that talk about vulnerability when you're going, he, he, ha, it, it really feels a little bit vulnerable. doesn't it? <laughs> and then you just realize everyone else is doing it. So yeah. it's okay. It's a field trip in my positive psychology class ever, you know, when I teach oh. that to first year students, we always go to a laughter. That's hysterical. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want to switch gears from what you have called positivity resonance to what I will call negativity dissonance. Because <laughs> I think we've all felt this at some point when we're trying to connect with people, we're trying to build up positive psychology resources and use our tools that we go shopping at Walmart like I did the other day. Behind me is a man and a woman who weren't wearing masks. So that made me uncomfortable. And I kindly said, you know, do you have masks? Could you put them on in a nice smiley sort of connecting way? And their answer was no. And I could tell they were very upset with me and turn their back and, uh, I looked, at the, I looked at the cashier and she rolled her eyes and she just told me, oh, I just got out of, I, um, I'm fully recovered from COVID. I was in the hospital with it, but this is why. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like it was, um, a, it was a moment of negativity dissonance with this other person, that there was, there was this separation. And I know that it has come up before in these webinars that we try and do these good things for ourselves, for our communities, for others. And, um, 
okay, I came home and ranted to my husband. That's not very helpful that, you know, I got it out, but it's not really helpful. Um, how do we use the buffering and bolstering, bolstering effect of positive psychology to protect us when we feel like there are others in the community who are acting in ways in which we find harmful or it may create some internal distraught in us um, for the safety of all. Yeah, well, you know, all emotions have their place and their value to us. Um, and we're not gonna escape negative emotions just for our efforts to try to increase the positive. And, you know, sometimes people don't wanna dance with you <laughs> in terms of the, you know, and this is, that's the- They didn't wanna I, dance with me, that was clear. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's no getting around the risks in, in social interaction. We, we can minimize them a little by creating a sense of safety um, within groups that we're leading or participating in, we can we can all contribute to the um, sense of safety in the in the space that we're we're sharing. But when we go out in public, there's not always that same commonality and concern with creating safety um, for others. And so we're going to bump up against your kind of situation. Um, this, uh, inevitably, you know, I feel like. Um, just uh, just because we try to bring the good doesn't mean that we're going to be successful, but we should keep trying, you know, because some there's a good proportion of time that it works mm -hmm. and those are priceless when it does. So um, I think that. Um, again, In other words, it doesn't solve the world's problems, Barbara. People are still people. That is, you know, with the good, the bad and all that goes with it. So. Yeah, but you can grow more resilient to that by yeah. um, those times when it works, those times when positivity resonance does, um, you know, uh, grow between you and others. Those those are good reflections and contributors to resilience, mm. and that resilience is what allows you to vent and then move on. <laughs> yeah, move on. Here, husband, hear all this. Yes, and, and Lois is, is uh, connecting with that thought of uh, conflicts on group, Zoom or group. I guess wherever two or more people gather, you're bound to have these issues. And um, I do think that it, it allows us these tools. It's not like they don't work because they don't solve every problem we run into. We're not sipping pina coladas by poolside just we would be bored stiff anyways doing that, let's face it. So I, I sometimes think of these things as um, fodder for personal experiments. Like how am I showing up in light of this? What are the ways in which I'm doing? Um, not to solve someone else's behavior, but how am I still choosing to be here uh, now? And, and um, the more you experiment with it, the more you uh, can just say, oh, I guess I guess that one didn't work. And then just <laughs> as opposed to take it personally yeah. you know I mean when we're feeling less resilient and less um safe all those rebuffs end up being little ways that we tear ourselves up so um I think we're able to um uh, let them roll off us a lot easier and so that we can enjoy the rest of what's out there to enjoy Mm. which is not everything. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, a, let's face it, it's not everything. But you did say that when we think about social interactions, which I love this analogy because I love chocolates, mm -hmm. uh, social interactions are like, think about it like chocolates. What, 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 what is that for people who haven't read the article? What do you mean by that? Well, there's um, so many different uh, types and flavors of, of um uh, chocolates, um, and we can uh, learn to savor them. But um, oh, oh, what was it, Forrest Gump? It was like saying, you know, just discover which ones you like. It life is a box of chocolates. You know, think of it that way. And how you how you take a moment to approach whether you're going to gobble down chocolate without paying attention, like I sometimes do really late at night, um, or take a moment and say, oh. 
this is my chocolate time and I'm going to favor it. You know, that we can take that orientation towards social interaction. You know, it's, it's the, the chocolate itself isn't good or bad, but how we approach it. You know, the interactions aren't good or bad. And it's how we approach it. And also we need, you know, I guess just to pull it a little, the analogy a little further, we probably shouldn't be eating chocolate 24 hours a day. You know, <laughs> and we also don't need to be interacting with people 24 hours a day because some some people find it both totally joyful and uplifting and exhausting mm -hmm. um, that's how people who are more introverted like myself um, uh, can just be like oh okay I just need some quiet time now so just because positive the affective quality of positive connections um, do have all these good things doesn't mean we should be in uh, seeking out connection at all times Oh, that's so that's so important, and I and I I want to underscore that because a lot of what we've heard from the community um, is, is they have been very isolated and don't get enough. And in fact, we can have even this social interaction if we really savor it, and when we do breakout groups and we uh, connect with it, it doesn't have to be. Um, a four course meal with you know a big chocolate dessert it can be a taste so those of you who feel have been feeling isolated um savoring the social interactions you do have to the best of your ability um and those who are getting a lot of social interaction knowing that that it's there comes a point where even you too need some space so thank you for that uh, that analogy I, I find that very helpful um okay uh, I noticed that we have, we're at about 15 minutes left. I do want to make sure that you as a community, if there are things that I, ha I have other questions, I never have a shortage of questions, but if you have things that you would want me to make sure I ask or uh, talk to Barbara about, please write that into the chat. And there's a note here that JCC is a program of calling older people who are participated in some ways to see if they need help. This type of outreach is a wonderful example of being connected. How lovely is that? Oops. All right. Ah. So the, the last thing that happened this morning after my husband noticed that I was ready, I was all friend and preem for my webinar, my hair looked good, <laughs> was my daughter telling me that she uh, got an appointment to get her COVID vaccine. Yay. <laughs> Yay. And you can see the relief in her face. You can see in the way that she moved, um, what a sense of relief and excitement. We had Dan Tomasulo on um, a couple days ago about hope. And I think sometimes uh, when we don't get the call for a vaccine or some of our young, younger folks don't have them yet, that we still feel like exhaustion set in. Are there any final comments of positivity, resonance, and the positive affect when it comes to holding out hope for what's next? Yeah, I think hope is, um, you know, obviously a super vital resource right now. And, and to be able to have this, uh, the, the definition, scientific definition of hope, I really resonate with it, which is fearing the worst, but yearning for better. So you're able to, you're not ignoring the worst. You're actually, you know, you got your eyes on the worst, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you're yearning for something better. And you think better is possible. Those are all important ingredients of, of hope. And when there's, um, not that much positive that we can connect over. Um, hope can be like the really in, important thing, like, you know, the, the, I was able to get an end of day vaccine for my son who wasn't in the right group yet, but, you know, so they don't waste them the same day I got my second dose. So I was over the moon for both of those. And we started thinking, where will we travel first when mm. will we travel? We don't know when that's going to be, but just having that sense of we might be able to do something again. And so having that ability to, to share in a positive possible future, the reason that's one reason that's so important is that that helps us become more um, inventive and planful on how we're going to get there. You know, because if we don't share our hopes, then we won't 
think creatively about how to get from this place where we're fearing the worst to that place where it's going to be better. You know, that's part of, um, uh, you know, the wonderful part of being human and having this big forebrain that can anticipate the future is we can anticipate positive futures, which unleashes innovation and effort and um, uh, just sort of uh, uh, resourcefulness and doggedness to make sure that that positive future is something that we help to bring about. Maybe we can't do it all by ourselves, but we can contribute. So. Mm, love that. Thanks, Barbara. I saw a bunch of things coming in as we were chatting. Um, so Kim, I'd love to hear, says, I'd love to hear Barbara talk about the upward spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one, so many of these processes in positive psychology um, are impactful because even though positive emotions are really short-lived and positive connections are very short-lived, they build in us durable resources that make it easier to get in, into these moments of uplift and connection the next time. So as we build our friendship, it's easier to connect the next time we see each other. As we uh, build our resilience, it's easier to um, kind of get past uh, you know, obstacles next time. So none of these things are like mental health doesn't cause positivity resonance or positivity resonance cause mental health. It's both and. There's so many aspects of the dynamics of positive psychology that are best understood as a both and reciprocal causality, which is why we can get on jags of an upward spiral. You know, that we, that's why that as we build our pro-social tendencies through positive connections, um, having those pro-social tendencies make it more likely that we're going to connect better. And then that kind of takes off. Now, one uh, colleague asked me, well, what keeps you from having that upward spiral up into the stratosphere and you're no longer, you know, connected to earth? I'm like, life happens. <laughs> yeah. all kinds life gives us plenty of now. damn opportunities to ground ourselves, unfortunately. Exactly. <laughs> so we get on these jags of upward spirals and then yeah we get setbacks yeah. that's just that's what happens but if we don't um uh put any effort into the positive side we're going to potentially stay in these downward spirals downward generally. and 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 honestly i thought i feel like that's one of the the um the things I see again and again as people learn positive psychology, they think, oh, I know this is, I shouldn't be sad or I, this shouldn't be happening or I should know how to pull myself out of it. I love what you just described. Yeah, you go upward spiral and then you boom, life happens. And, and it's a practice. It is a way of uh, keep orientating oneself, not not like, oh, now I have it or I don't. That right. Point. And I, I think that's one of the uh, most serious misunderstandings of positive psychology. Like you can just choose to be happy. Yeah. You know, I mean, people use that phrase and maybe to them it means I'm going to invest in these upward spiral processes and these nuances, but other people hear it as, oh, right. you just flip a switch and you're happy. Yeah, right. You know, so we need to, uh, this is why I think a focus on emotions as moments mm -hmm. can really um, be useful because all you need to do is try to, you know, see if you can inject more of the positive moments in a day. Doesn't mean all day. It's not nonstop joy or nonstop interest. It's it's just a, a, a feeding yourself that a little bit more. Yeah. You know. So I mean, think of Nutri it, like nutrients and uh, yeah, nutrients. You know, just because fruits and vegetables are good doesn't mean we eat them twenty four seven. We don't yeah. eat all day long. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're 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 little infusions, and emotions are like that. And positive psychology practices are like that. And I think when people get the impression that you know, oh, I I know this cognitively, and so it's all going to be smooth sailing from here. It's just not. We have a lot of food analogies, Barbara. We must be getting hungry for lunch. So I had a couple of questions that came in about, thank you, Karen, for uplifting this about the vagal tone. Uh, I think I lost one. Um, so, oh, uh, Caroline was talking about, said that Dan T was talking about vagal tone and loving kindness and suggested we ask you about it. 
I wonder the effect of negative interactions on vagal tones. Thanks, uh, yeah. Caroline, and thank you. Well, for there's um, uh, a theory within psychology that um, positions the, the vagus nerve as um, part of the social engagement system, as part of our biological capacity for connection. And we have found through a number of studies that um, uh, people who have higher heart rate variability, which is one way to measure cardiac vagal tone, is uh, that predicts how much, how often you'll be in the company of others and the, the emotional quality of those interactions. And it predicts um, how uh, effective, if you will, loving kindness meditation is in uplifting your day-to-day -day positive emotions. And one important thing about our vagal tone is it's not set in stone. This is also a resource that can grow and become stronger for us over time. And uh, we found that people who practice loving kindness meditation um, more to the point where they experience positive emotions and positive connections that those emotional and connection pathways help to um, strengthen uh, the vagus nerve. I'm, I'm going here because it's <laughs> connecting your brain to your heart. So um, in case people yeah. are wondering, this isn't a tick, this is actually the vagal tone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so we shouldn't be thinking of our biological capacity for connection as hardwiring, you know, and that that um, that analogy is used a lot. We're wired to connect or hardwired to connect. I mean, in humans, wiring is not hard, it's soft. <laughs> yeah. And that softness means that it's responsive to our experiences. There's plasticity there. And that plasticity, I think, in a lot of places follows a use it or lose it law that it, as we connect our biological capacity for connection is strengthened and um, fortified and connection becomes easier and easier. This is what worries me about the pandemic. All this time spent isolated, our social skills are going to be rusty. You know, our, our, um, it's going to feel more awkward and maybe riskier as we go out in the world again. And, and you know, positivity resonance uh, rests on feeling safe. And so if we're, if we have residual, like, uh, is there a new variant out here? Am I okay? Yeah. Yeah. You know, th things are going to impede our ability to connect with one another. So I think just you know, bringing that awareness to it that we're probably rusty. We're going to have to relearn a lot of this, just like we had to learn how to connect over Zoom. Exactly. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not even, it's not even a remembering or a um, rusty. It's an, actually a new way of connecting. We had to actually learn new ways in which to connect in this world. And I know as we get into the next stage and we're opening up, and I remember thinking back, you know, how much, how far as a society, we've come in such a short period of time to understand what we need to do to protect ourselves. It's astounding when you think of the rate of change. So I hold out hope that with this new flexibility we've had to sort of endure and learn and grow into, that we're in better shape now for the next step because hopefully if we're building those skills over time, when we get back together, um, we can do it in a way that says, oh, I don't feel safe with this, but this way I feel safe. Let's, let's talk about what would make it uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. work out. So I have two minutes left and I am ultimately aware I did not get through all of your questions and <laughs> Robert could have stayed here, I think, for uh, the whole afternoon and I'm sure we would still not get through the conversation. Um, there is one thing though that I do not want to miss and that is to give back to Barbara a piece of what she has given us today. So if you could spend some time in chat right now, one word that you got from what Barbara has shared, how it has made you feel, what new opening um, or insight have you gained? It doesn't have to be a paragraph, but I would like to actually fill Barbara's cup uh, as she has filled ours this year. So. Um, I'm just going to uh, have you do that. And as you write that in, I'm just going to say, Barbara, I'm appreciative of connecting in friendship over this time. Every time I get together with you, I have 
boom, my brain lights up. And I, you know, <laughs> preparing for it, I read a lot, doing it, I read a lot, and then afterwards. So it's a continual uplift for me. So well, we it's always hope. fun. It's always fun. I agree. We have hope and better than before, balance. Ah. I'm going to have to savor that later because it's just flying by, but I will. I will. Well, I will. I will. I will email it to you, or Caroline will email you all of the chats that are coming in, so that Thank you can you. see Thank and hold you. on That's to. That's really those. nice way to end. I appreciate that for your positivity portfolio. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so for all of us here in this community, Barbara. Um, from my own heart, thank you for being here today. Caroline, did you want to take us out? Yes, absolutely. Um, just thank you so much. It was so informative and it, it was such a wonderful way to round out the year, to mark a year anniversary. And I, I'm stunned that we are here mm -hmm. a year later, right? Yeah. In this forum and, um, and that we may be rusty, but I have hope that Love 2.0 is waiting out there for us. And thank you for giving us that opportunity to thank explore you. that. Everyone, take care of yourselves. Be well. We'll see you on Thursday. And uh, thank you again, Megan. Thank you again, Barbara. Just such gratitude. Take care. Everybody. Much love, everybody. Bye.